Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Hamlin Leo lecture. Welcome to March. Welcome to Friday. My name is Molly Glevy. I work in the Alumni Relations Office at Hamlin, and I'm so excited to be with all of you today and with Dr. Jamie Spalding to talk about the future of forensic science and how Hamlin University is leading the way. If you are not familiar with our forensic science program at Hamlin University, you're in for a treat. Uh, before we get started, I'll mention a few things just about our webinar today. Uh, I'll introduce Dr. Spalding and then we will get started. Uh, again, my name is Molly Glevy. I work in the Alumni Relations Office and we have a few more Leo lectures yet this spring. Uh, we have one with Alex Folk, Folky, our athletic director uh, in April. And then in May, Dr. Patty Bourne, who will be talking about uh, the United Nations Climate Summit that she attended just this fall. So take a look on our website. You can find more information there. You can also find all of our past Leo lectures if you're interested in taking a look at some of those. Uh, for those of you who are with us live today on March 1st, I will also mention that it is award season at Hamlin University, not just for our students who are preparing to graduate, but also for alums. So. If you are interested and so inclined, we are taking nominations for alumni awards. We're also taking nominations for Hall of Fame. All of that in information is on our website and the deadline for both is April 1st. So with that, I'm going to get us started. Just a few housekeeping items. Of course, as you know, you're muted, your camera is off. If you have a question for Dr. Spalding, please go ahead and use the Q&A. Uh, Dr. Spalding will take those questions at the end of his talk today, but you don't need to wait. Go ahead and put those into the Q&A whenever they come to mind. If anything comes up about chat or logistics or you want to say hello, we like that too, go ahead and use the chat function in your Zoom dashboard. And with that, I am going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Jamie Spalding. Jamie Spalding is Assistant Professor and Program Director of Forensic Science in Hamlin's Department of Criminal Justice and Forensic Sciences. Professor Spalding specializes in the interpretation of forensic pattern evidence, specifically fingerprint and firearm evidence, forensic intelligence modeling to extend the utility of forensic, one second here. <laughs> there we go beyond traditional case-by-case -case basis usage, and the development of software for investigative usage. Before coming to Hamlin in the fall of 2020, Dr. Spalding completed a BA in criminology, a BS and an MS in forensic and investigative science, and a PhD in forensic science from West Virginia University. And with that, Jamie, take it away. There we are. Uh, thank you, Molly, for the introduction and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I was asked to think about what uh, what I might want to share here uh, for a Leo lecture and share with our alumni. And and the thing that comes to mind for me is is the, a lot of the excitement that I have is around uh, our forensic science program and um, some of the work that we're doing. So I want to share that with you here this morning. And since we are one of the few programs in the Midwest, there's only a, a handful of us, um, I'd like to talk about how uh, Hamlin University, our program, can actually shape the future of forensic science um, in ways that you know maybe you see on TV and CSI or those other crime shows. So I'd like to um, start off with just a, a little bit about me. So um, currently, I oversee the forensic science program. I have led the charge to develop the majors um, and the program that we have here today. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, before that, as Molly mentioned, I finished my PhD at, at West Virginia University. Um, that, I believe, was the one of two programs in the country that offered a PhD in forensic science. And I am from the initial graduating class. Um, before that, I'm from a town without a traffic light in upstate New York. So. Um, the other thing I want to share, this is um, my wife, and, and I'm very, very lucky to have a seven-week-old little boy, so we're, we're very excited about that as well. Um, 
that's a little bit about me. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer those and, and share some experiences that I have and uh, translate into what we do at the program level. Uh, brief agenda, I already mentioned a little of this. We're gonna talk about the program um, and, and I love showcasing the experiences that our students have, some of the innovative research uh, that my group is conducting, and then a little bit about how we bridge that gap between academia and practice uh, by sharing some, some of the things we're doing with our partners in the community. Um, so our program, uh, before I get to that, I just like a definition of forensic science because there are a lot of different definitions. Uh, really what it comes down to is, you know, the, the application of science to law. That's what that condition of forensic means. Um, and I, I bold here factual information because you know, wrongful convictions have happened. So how do we uh, provide actually factual, truthful information without overstating the power of it? That's a lot of the training our students receive. Um, oftentimes, you'll have forensic scientists testify as expert witnesses based on the analyses that they've conducted or their interpretation of um, you know, some sort of pattern or some sort of a chemical or uh, DNA in a blood stain. And, and our fundamental goal, as you see there, is to really figure out or uncover what took place. And we do that a few different ways. One, we like to identify things, you know, so you can have a, a white powder here. And the question is, you know, what is this substance? We try and identify that. It might be illicit in some particular manner, or it could be cornstarch, sucrose, something like that. Uh, believe it or not, criminals will rip off other criminals. So that is a possibility as well. So identification is something that we, we work quite hard to do. Individualization, trying to say that, you know, it was uh, Jamie Spaulding that touched this particular coffee mug. Um, we can do that with fingerprints or, you know, with DNA to say that, um, you know, this, this touch uh, sample of sweat in skin cells belongs to myself, or this hair with a root belongs to myself. So individualizing that to a, a person, um, associating things, you know, was this cartridge case that we found, um, you know, at, at the scene of the crime, was that discharged by this particular firearm, or was that bullet recovered from this firearm? Is this paint chip from uh, this vehicle we recovered from a body shop that we believe was in a hit and run. So associating things as well as reconstruction. And um, you get to see a, a picture of much younger me doing some blood stain <laughs> reconstruction, trying to figure out um, where that particular droplet came from and then utilizing that to say this corroborates or refutes the, uh, the testimony that takes place. It's very hard to say it was self-defense if you know you repeatedly bludgeon someone with uh, an implement, so that is what we try and do in forensic science, and and I think by and large the idea of uncovering actions is captured well by a lot of the crime shows and, and CSI and things like that that people you know watch. But it is quite sensationalized. Um, you know, I don't have the ability to walk into a crime scene and smell a cartridge case behind a refrigerator my favorite episode of CSI. Uh, and, and so trying to give us uh, some of the realities of that to our students is really what we strive to do. And, and our mission here is to make it interdisciplinary in scope. You know, if you um, take the example of this fingerprint on this coffee mug, it is something that's biological, right? Skin cells, we're gonna develop it chemically and then we're going to analyze that pattern. So it's a lot of synergies between the different knowledge and fundamental uh, underlying information the students have to get. And then on top of it, we have to elevate the standard of the field so that they are you know, not only comp competent, excuse me, and able to do the work, but they are reliable. We can, we can rely on their expertise to solve these cases. And, and I try and make that standard for our students. If, if something were to happen in my house to my wife, I would trust my students going out into the workforce. They're going to be the ones that would show up at that scene. So that's a little bit about what we do. 
um, here at Hamlin in the forensic science program. A uh, little history of the program, it's undergone some really recent change, but it started out as a collaboration between the university and the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension years ago at the time all faculty were uh, active scientists at the lab or investigators uh, for BCA, and students would take an anthropology, biology, or chemistry um, undergraduate degree. They would complete a forensic science certificate to get a least a foundational understanding. Um, in, in 2023, I implemented uh, these new majors, and really you can see why we did that. It's a rapidly evolving field. Anyone who watches the news knows the intricacies of crime anymore. Um, we we also had quite a bit of student demand that we that we needed, as well as you know increasing the diversity of the field because a variety of backgrounds are going to be able to look at these situations and investigations in a different way and provide complementary and symbiotic sort of perspectives. And since the launch of these majors in 2023, I now have over 70 majors and uh, an additional 30 students completing our minor. So it's a very, very rapidly growing, robust program <clears throat> that we have. Um, in terms of the program, we are the only forensic science uh, program in Minnesota. And what I mean by that is uh, you cannot get a bachelor's degree from any other university in the state. We're one of a few regionally uh, that offer this, this type of degree. Um, and, and what we have is a variety of different offerings. So we have a program that specializes in forensic and investigative science for students that maybe want to go do crime scene work or death investigation, uh, work at medical examiner's offices, things of that nature. And then we have the bachelor's of science degree in forensic science, and that's really designed to put our students into crime labs in a variety of different disciplines. So uh, forensic biology meets the standards of practice set forth by the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigations Quality Assurance Standards. We make sure our students are, are qualified to meet all of those, as well as getting hands-on time with forensically relevant specimens, you know, blood stains, um, other biological fluids as well as uh, the integral concentration in the other side being forensic chemistry. So thinking about seized drugs, uh, thinking about uh, ignitable liquids, if there's an arson or fire scene, thinking about explosive residues, if, if that was a situation to arrive, a, a bomb threat or, or any sort of toxicological, anything that applies chemistry directly to resolve a crime um, is where that's gonna come in, you know, trace evidence, things of that nature. And uh, we do that in conjunction with a post-baccalaureate certificate. Since we are the only program in the state, we know that, um, you know, sometimes a student doesn't immediately know their path from the very beginning. So if they graduate from a, a school here with a natural science degree in biology, chemistry, physics, et cetera, they can come and uh, complete the certificate to get that understanding of forensic science as they sort of uh, navigate their pathway uh, forward into a career. And um, you can see all the images throughout this are going to be things that, that we do. We have at the top right corner, um, this is a, a crime scene that we ran in front of Old Main. I called the students out at about 2.30 in the morning, snowing about an inch an hour at the time, uh, about 12 degrees. And there's no other way to understand the realities of what investigators face than to live those experiences. So you can see that on the bottom, you see a former student, she just graduated, um, doing some analysis of, of seized drugs. So we have um, authentic specimens that we use at a very low level, and she would go through and perform those examinations to say on that last slide, you know, this white powder is in fact um, cocaine hydrochloride. That's illicit, and you could charge that. So uh, those are some of the some of the things that we offer. Um, this particular slide, it really showcases the vastness of forensic science, and that's why I like it. Um, you see this really explicitly those synergies and interdisciplinary nature of forensic science that I was talking about. And these are all of the different disciplines and domains and careers that students can go into. Um, and, and I want to just subset this very briefly. 
these are the ones that are still um, you know, present. Those are ones that our students can actually uh, have as careers when they leave here. They meet those qualifications. Um, we don't have a digital program at the moment. Um, and, you know, we don't have a nursing school or a dental school that would make forensic nursing and forensic odontology. Um, and then canine units. I, I have a couple dogs at home. I don't need a kennel here on campus. Uh, but you do see all of the different prospective careers our students could have after they leave our programs here in Hamlin. And you also see, um, you know, the interdisciplinary nature within each of those, right, from chemistry to biology and how we use those in, in interpretation to bring resolution to a case. Um, and, and oftentimes this is not the 42 minute bundle that we see on TV. Um, it's, it's, you know, quite a long process that depends on a lot of different separate individuals along the way to share their expertise and bring closure to a case, implicate um, a person without reservation. Um, and of course, you know, a lot of this is, is done uh, with a lot of different people. You know, not one person can be an expert in everything. So we have um, uh, Megan Foley. She's going to be joining us this fall. She's going to bring an expertise in DNA that, that supersedes what, uh, what I have and what we currently have. We have some um, adjunct instructors that work or worked for the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. They add that practical case experience. And we also have a, a dependence on, on faculty and other programs such as you know, Dr. Pacheco Flores teaching a forensic anthropology course so that if they're at a, uh, a scene of crime or a, they are out doing a search like you would see on television, those giant line searches through woods, you pick up a, a bone, is this faunal, is it from a bear, or is this a human uh, forensically relevant specimen? Uh, Dr. Povolitis is um, in our chemistry program, she teaches instrumental analysis, so a lot of our forensic chemistry students are there. And we also have um, that legal standard to uphold. So Dr. Arnott has provided expertise there teaching things about testimony as well as you know, um, courtroom procedure for our students so that they can get that well-rounded versed experience in all of these different disciplines. Um, sharing some of our courses, um, we have a whole host of topics that we teach. All students start with our survey course that I treat like skipping a stone across the pond so that they can find the things that they maybe want to do for, you know, the next 20, 30 years, find their passion. And then they get to craft the remainder of their time here in narrative with these courses, such as, you know, crime scene for our investigative students, forensic biology, where they can get hands-on experience with biological evidence or forensic chemistry for drugs. We have a whole suite of cameras so that they can document these scenes and evidence, uh, fingerprints, firearms, other topics uh, based on uh, people from the BCA that have the availability to come in, such as blood stain pattern analysis or trace evidence. Um, and then that sort of comes all full circle when we talk about the professional issues within the field, you know, look, looking forward for the next five years, what are the things that they're going to encounter as the field develops? Uh, so that they're aptly equipped for that. And then finally, we require an inter internship of all students to graduate. So we work quite diligently with our partners and community to get them the practical experience. It's going to accelerate their ability to get jobs and be successful in those careers once they have them. So this is um, a general list of, of the different courses. I'll share some experiences uh, from a few of them. So um, the first one, uh, I know it's gotten some media attention recently, would be uh, my crime scene and death investigation class. Um, we're very privileged to have a full crime scene house that we can train in. It's uh, staged with furniture. It looks just like a residential dwelling. Um, you go inside and the students have the ability to, you know, um, undertake mock crime scene exercises so that they you know, can actually understand the relationship of evidence between different parts of a scene. How do we collect it and document it in uh, the interposition of those different items of evidence? Um, it's, it's impossible to do in a realistic scenario in a classroom. 
So um, that gives us an, another layer of reality where students can actually go into what would be an active crime scene and, and process it for evidence. Um, this is generally what it looks like. So we can see this is a, our students in an active scene in the house. So this is our living room. You've got couches. You have a uh, recliner, coffee table, different pieces of evidence here on the floor. Of course, they're wearing protective equipment because they have to protect the scene from them, right? We don't need our hair. Or we don't need to contaminate our scene, but also themselves from the scene so that um, if there is anything in there, you know, biological fluids or, or some other specimen, they're protected from that. Um, you can see other exercises that maybe we do complete in a classroom, such as uh, shooting reconstruction, you know, where could this shot have originated from? Does that line up with your witness statements? Um, as well as the overnight scenes. So this year um, we, can, we conducted that and how the scene works is uh, we designate a week of the semester sometime between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. One night of that week, they're going to get a phone call from my bright shining voice summoning them to an active scene somewhere on campus. Um, you can see last year's image that was in front of Old Main in the snow on the top here. This was one of our mannequins used as a victim um, in a uh, staged shooting scenario. And then here you can see uh, several of our students examining um, this victim, this mannequin, um, in their position on the next scene uh, that we ran this year. And really it's it's, it's because crime scenes don't occur, you know, right now. This would be far too convenient. You know, it's it's an entirely different story to wake up in the middle of the night, go out when it's cold, and, and deal with the elements of taking a photograph in the middle of the night, deal with uh, police lights in the background, media crews that are there heckling our students for information, just like they would on an active scene for the BCA. So I really pride myself on the, this experience in that, when they leave Hamlin, they know exactly what they are going to be doing for a career. They know the challenges and they can excel in it. And, and that's what we strive to do, not only in this course, but in all of them. Um, in terms of uh, forensic biology, you can see a student here, they were uh, doing a Castlemeyer phenolphthalein test of blood. If you watch crime shows, you've probably seen this one. It's quite common. Um, on, a, on a towel, so you'll take a swab, you'll perform the test if it gets this nice pink color that is a positive indication of blood. We also use other tests like Blue Star. Um, if you watch the crime shows, this would be Luminol. Um, Blue Star is just another commercial brand. This is a chemiluminescent in blood, so uh, it can be naked, uh, invisible to the naked eye and it will uh, luminesce this blue color for a period of time. Um, and with Dr. Foley coming in this fall, we will have um, better capabilities in DNA. So you can see the genetic analyzer that we use. You can see what a DNA profile, and this one's actually a mixture to add those complexities to our students. So it's not just, you know, this blood stain belongs to Joe Soap, this, uh, this particular stain has contribu contributions from this individual and this individual, you know, working that out in a way that they can solve more complex cases as well using DNA, um, such as, um, you know, maybe human trafficking or gang related scenarios or those related to sexual assault. Um, in terms of forensic chemistry, as I said, this relies heavily on instrumentation. Um, so be it a drug sample, be it a, a piece of um, duct tape that was used in um, on an explosive device or to bind a, a victim, you know, we try and identify or associate what those pieces of things are. So you can see some of the instrumentation that we use, like uh, spectroscopy, as well as uh, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry uh, to solve uh, those questions, so instrumental analysis is integral to that. How do they sample these things? Because we can't collect things like doors. We can't analyze every tablet on a pallet. Um, if you see in the news a, a seizure of, of, you know, a thousand pounds or a ton of fentanyl in the port, port of Baltimore, I believe was the last one, 
you know, we can't analyze every single bit of it. So how do we do that in a way that we're certain this is in fact fentanyl and this percentage of it is. Uh, seized drugs, you can see color tests uh, being performed here as a screening measure. We'll also do some examinations microcrystally under a microscope, so a student doing that, um, as well as trace evidence. These are um, you know, images of uh, glass chips being associated from a broken window to um, that collected from a person's clothing. You can see physical fits of duct tape if they have that jigsaw fit together. That's a very high level of association, as well as paint from a mock uh, hit and run scene that we've given them. So this is actually layered automotive paint from, uh, forget the make and model vehicle, but they can uh, make those associations microscopically like you see here, and then ultimately using the instrumentation you see on the other side to follow up and, and make certain that that association is true. Um, additionally, uh, arson and explosive evidence, you know, trying to use a, a burned piece of garbage or a carpet or some sort of fire debris evidence to examine whether or not the presence of an accelerant such as gasoline, kerosene, um, or even rubbing alcohol was present uh, to accelerate the propagation of that fire. So these are all things that our students get hands-on experience with. In terms of fingerprints, everything you see here is going to be student work. Um, again, right, so this is a temperate card of one of the students in our class uh, compared to a latent fingerprint from the crime scene house. So just from them being in there, touching things, um, and I believe this one was actually off of a plastic bottle. I would have students kind of with a blindfold touch things, discard them, put them around the house. And their task is just like in casework, go back to the forensic lab that we have, develop that fingerprint using, I believe they use um, black powder in this case, and then compare it to our set of uh, suspects. So they made a positive association in this case. We do a lot of different development techniques. Um, you see all of those on the right side of the screen from um, a very evident Pepsi can to a uh, fingerprint developed in blood and enhanced with uh, leucocrystal violet, um, using fluorescent powders in a dark room. It, it gives a comprehensive experience from crime scene to lab to final conclusion. And then ultimately students get the opportunity to do mock testimony on these cases where their work becomes scrutinized and, and challenged, just like it should be at, by a proper defense. So um, those experiences, and then I just want to give a shout out to our partners in the community for, for the invaluable internship experience they provide. Uh, we have students at agencies throughout the Twin Cities, um, and we, we do have, we're one of only a few institutions that have a partnership with the Mayo Clinic and their medical examiner's office for death investigation and medical examiner internships. So we're very, very fortunate for that, um, as well as students that you know maybe aren't from the area. Uh, we had a student, I think last year, complete an internship with uh, the Department of Justice down in Texas. They have family somewhere else. Maybe they want to, uh, you know, run away from some of the cold winters that we have, right? Um, they, there's other places they want to live. We work very, very closely with agencies there to get students internships. And um, I'm hoping in the next year, the FBI honors, inter honors internship was just posted, and I have some students interested in that. So hopefully we can add um, that prestigious internship to this list as well. Uh, but throughout the region, um, our students are really, really working quite hard for these agencies, gaining that experience that'll give them uh, really, really jump-started careers. Okay, so in terms of student research, uh, excuse me, in terms of student experiences from class, those are just a few uh, things that we do. But we oftentimes extend that into innovative research beyond the classroom. Um, so I want to just shout, uh, shout out several of the students that have worked with me in recent years. Um, some are still active in my research group. Some have gone on to graduate school. Some are in uh, labs across the field, other professions. So we do a variety of different topics in my group. Um, my bio at the beginning, I specialize in, in the interpretation of evidence. 
Um, in that way, we try and apply, you know, very high standards across multiple different things. There have been um, numerous instances where in the recent years, fingerprint firearm evidence has undergone scrutiny, whereas DNA and drug chemistry have been sort of hailed as a gold standard. Um, so how do we how do we make sure that everything is getting it absolutely right? Uh, we have to conduct some novel research. I just want to share some of the progress um, that we've done here at the university, even in the short amount of time with these students. So I'm going to talk about Indigo's project, Gina's project, and Natalie's project. And they they primarily lead these projects for, uh, for our research group. So in the case of Indigo's project, um, we set out to answer a really challenging question. And we weren't sure that we would be able to do this. And that was, how can we better recover fingerprints um, that have been aged a, a long time or, or quite a while? And to that end, we, we realized that a major component of fingerprints is water that is going to very rapidly evaporate. That's been characterized quite well. So the study that we undertook was, can we recover those uh, using rehydration? So a lot of her work has been trying to deposit a fingerprint, understand how it evaporates, how those chemical residues change. Uh, so we leave them out for you know hours, weeks, even months if you think about a cold case. I believe the longest prints that we examined were at seven months. Then you can see in the middle here, we have some sort of an aged or degraded fingerprint. It's actually pretty difficult to see on my screen. So if you can't see it through the, the webinar, I apologize for that, but you aren't missing very much. A lot of that water has gone down. The ridges are much thinner. We're actually losing uh, minutia points or features within that print we use for comparison. And uh, you know we understand that you know not everywhere can go get end instrumentation. So we have to do this in a practical sense if it's going to be adopted by the field. So this is a um, watertight Rubbermaid container from Target and a $10 humidifier from um, Amazon, I believe that was from. So we'll take these fingerprints that have been aged up to seven months, put it in there for um, a duration of time that we've, we've uh, sort of optimized. And then ultimately on the back end, you can see these fingerprints are actually high quality, zooming into the ridges. We can see these features again, such as a bifurcation. We can actually see the edges of the ridges. So right now we're working to validate this with you know, a lot of different people over even longer term weathering, but the results are quite promising that we can recover fingerprints um, at a higher quality that have been aged months and months and months. So here you can see that ridge, that ridge width diminishing across uh, two prints that I just pulled up. Print one was um, actually on glass, print two is on plastic, so we tried different surfaces. And then this is really um, the exciting part here. So this is a fingerprint that was put on a glass slide and is seven months old, that was on the previous screen. And hopefully you can see the difference in information, especially in this area right here after it's been rehydrated. This is before that development that enhances it even further. So we're actually able to recover 97% of that original fingerprint after seven months and only 30 minutes of rehydration. And the implication of this is if you had, for, um, for example, a firearm that was used in a case in the, you know, five years ago, that fingerprint's gonna be very difficult to develop. It's gonna take um, subset of the techniques. It's not going to give the examiner all of the options that they really would rely on in a more recent case. So you risk losing information. That handprint that lets that perpetrator um, evade suspicion. And in this case, we're hopeful that we can, you know, sort of rehydrate these prints in a way that give us the capabilities to bridge that gap and, and provide, you know, justice in those cases that might have been cold for a duration of time. So this one's very exciting. Um, Indigo and I actually presented this at a conference um, of, of investigators throughout the state. And I can say that some labs are actually starting to uh, utilize the methodology, which is very exciting. Whenever we can see a tangible change on practice and, and make their jobs a little bit easier. 
uh, while at the same time, you know, graduating someone who's an expert in this that can go out and implement that in another lab as well. Um, you know, elevating what we do. So that's how we can advance something that's more traditional. Another uh, research project, thinking about how we can utilize technology. There's a, a lot of information out about, you know, machine learning, AI, uh, how do we use computers to support examiners in a more efficient, proactive way? So uh, this is a Gina's project. You can see up in the top what we what we have here is a piece of duct tape that has been torn. Um, and we're trying to see, okay, what is the rarity of this tear? Can we associate it to um, a, a roll, right? So we can say that this piece of tape came from this roll recovered from the uh, garage of Joe Soap. And we tried to do this by building a computational approach, form of an algorithm. And what it does is it does some image processing, gives us uh, just that edge, detects that edge automatically without um, actually any interference from the examiner or any work. It um, extracts that profile. It uh, transforms it so it finds any rotational differences. It then aligns the profile. And, and we've, I believe most people understand that when you use duct tape, it's not a perfect tear. There's going to be things like distortion that we can see here where some of that elasticity tore. You're going to have some of these threads that maybe don't align personally uh, perfectly. Uh, but this algorithm was actually published in uh, Forensic Science International. I hail that as one of the top journals in the field. So we're very excited about that. Um, you can see, you know, going from this manual comparison made by an examiner, do these pieces line up? And is this sufficient to say that it came from this role and not any other role that could exist on Earth? Um, to something where we can quantitatively say, I need 27% of that two inch duct tape. And given these scores, this algorithm can predict whether or not they are a mated pair or they are no non-matching pairs, meaning that it would be an exclusion. So if an examiner were to take an image like this, reach a, a level of association, say, yes, I believe this duct tape came from this sample, um, we could also run this algorithm behind them. And if they are in agreement, that would provide quite strong support that it is in fact a match. I don't like the word match, but um, that's that's really what it would be. And it also helps alleviate some of the scrutiny of this is no longer subjective. It's not one person's opinion against another person's opinion. It is an objective uh, metric that can provide support for ID and individualizing those or excluding those. So we're very, very uh, happy with this project and, and the publication and how that's been received by the community. Um, I'm working with an agency at the moment who's, who's interested in this, as well as uh, some other students coming through the research group are looking to follow up. How do we make this better? So it's, you know, 27% on maybe a piece of tape that was cut with scissors or on electrical tape that maybe doesn't have any of the artifacts like the yarn, the scrim within the uh, duct tape or some of the adhesive pr uh, properties that make duct tape challenging, which you can also see in that image on the left. So um, that's our that's our algorithm. It works, works very, very well. Uh, finally, Natalie's project is to gain a better understanding of how examiners look at these features and make decisions. So uh, we have an eye tracking system here at the university that if you're sitting at a computer and you're looking at a screen, it creates a heat map of what you're looking at. It records how long you look at a particular feature um, and the pathway that your eye actually moves. And from that, we can make decisions. So. You can see uh, the system here on a, on a laptop computer. You can see how it uh, calibrates to the person using it. So it actually tracks their eyes. Um, and what we did is we gave them a series of, of comparisons to make. So you can see um, casework quality fingerprints. This is a fingerprint in blood being compared to another latent print from a, um, a can. And we are curious to see what examiners are looking at. We can create heat maps of those. 
And then we can actually look at what are the differences between an examiner? You know, is a senior examiner looking at certain things versus a junior examiner versus a student? And if there is a difference in one reaching a identification and one maybe not having the confidence to do that, can we articulate what that is? Furthermore, we can look at how reproducible a person is. Um, I don't know about several of you, but you generally work better at one part of the day, you might have that afternoon lull. Maybe you shouldn't look at casework in the afternoon if that's the case. Does it affect your performance in a substantive way? So we can do that in, in hopes to try and make uh, fingerprint comparisons even more reliable than they are today. So that's some uh, work that's ongoing in our research group. Um, and, and we have other projects in, in DNA, the transfer of DNA. We have other projects in, um, in some analytical chemistry, trying to associate pieces of evidence more closely to maybe how they were made. Um, there, there are a whole host of things that we're doing. If, if anyone's interested, I can, I can answer questions about that. And then uh, finally, you know, I, as, as the only program in the state, it's, it's really our responsibility to be good stewards to our, our partners in the community. So uh, none of this is possible without them, right, from internships to uh, career options to insight on things that we're doing uh, in these research programs of, you know, we have the ability to look at challenges that maybe they don't have the ability to because I don't have a case that I have to respond to tomorrow. Um, so can we provide some of these solutions, such as with the fingerprint rehydration, so that they can get better evidence and solve cases uh, better here locally, as well as um, you know, coming in, sharing you know, the professional standards of the field with our students, what it, you know, what their experiences are, some of their job history, so that they really leave Hamlin. Um, you know, with, with wide open, clear eyes of what their future holds for them. Um, and that that is, you know, partners such as BCA, uh, local organizations like the Minnesota Division of the International Association of Identification. They hold an annual conference that our students have presented at, you know, local uh, police agencies, uh, forensic lab, uh, all of which have some forensic capabilities the uh, Midwest lab up in Anoka County, as well as the ME's office uh, down at Mayo Clinic, you know, the Hennepin lab, um, medical examiner's office. There's a, a whole lot of people that, uh, that we work with very closely. And we also engage the community for future forensic scientists, right? The next generation of forensic science, as I like to call it. We've uh, worked with some of the local schools uh, across the area, um, we, we helped the, uh, a Girl Scout troop get their investigator badge. So um, we're very, very happy to work with those students and, and show them you know, how exciting forensic science is. Um, working with uh, Health Occupation Students of America, a Minnesota chapter, uh, we've worked with them. Um, we do a little bit of consultation on casework. So if an agency has something that maybe they don't have an expertise in that we can provide some help with, uh, we do that you know, as well as um, if there is something related to a case, we've made some media appearances to try and, you know, help the public understand that, yeah, in this particular sense, this is how it's done. Um, you know, if a test wasn't conducted, and, you know, people are like, why wasn't this conducted? Uh, providing an impartial experience or an impartial um, bit of our experience is also um, something that we like to do. So, with that, um, that's what I have. I see one in the questions and answers, but if you have more questions, I'm happy to field those. Um, I think we have some time for that. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Q and A, uh, what other courses non-forensic are required to get a degree? So since we are um, going to be you know, interdisciplinary, I think that introductory biology, chemistry, and, and physics courses are, are paramount to getting those uh, type of experiences and being able to understand that interdisciplinary pay of, you know, what is actually going on with this evidence and what order should it be analyzed, as well as to interpret it statistics. 
you know, so those are those are some of the things that I, I really, really require of my students so that they can go out and really be experts and, and quite frankly, know more about the contemporary state of the field than maybe some of the people that work there. Um, that's our, our goal. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Um, what do students learn to handle the stress or emotional reactions? Um, I think that is always a challenge. And I think that's where we rely on our, our some of our partners, some of the internship experience about, you know, how do you go into these situations and how do you be impartial? Excuse me, how do you be impartial and how do you be scientific and, and actually solve these? It's it's quite a challenge because oftentimes in forensic science or investigations, we don't see the best of the society and the world that we live in. So that's a challenge. Um, I will say it's it's getting better in the field in terms of psychological support, um, in terms of service providers, for you know if you're in a law enforcement or if you're in these other other sort of forensic fields. So we do touch on that um, in in professional issues as well because that is one of the the foremost professional issues is is, is not just about the job; it's about you as well. Um, so we do some of that. Um, but it's it's very, very challenging because all people are different how they handle handle these things. Um, and and I think everyone else, you know, also has to have a bit of an understanding of the things that bother them versus other people. Um, like for me, cases involving children are, are particularly difficult for me. Um, you know, whereas there are some students that have close family uh, members that, you know, maybe we're uh, victims of a suicide or a sexual assault and finding, you know, where those sort of traps are for them. Um, and, and maybe the case is that they can't be impartial or would cause harm to themselves with. So we do talk about some of that. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, salary range, it, it depends. Um, it really depends on what it is that you're doing and where you're doing it. Um, I will say here in the Twin Cities, um, depends on the agency, but you're looking, well, firstly at, at, at the benefits package, which is generally pretty good, but you're also looking at a, a trainee salary somewhere in the range of, I'd say 40 until you gain that year of experience, you come off a probationary experience, and then you can uh, scale up through different levels of promotion as you go through the lab. Um, and that, it's a ballpark number. It, it depends on the agency. Um, it depends on your capacity. You know, if you are a, uh, um, an evidence technician, you're going to make a different salary than a DNA analyst who's going to make a different salary than a drug chemist. Um, so, so it ultimately depends on your role. Are you doing things in a quality system? So it's, it's difficult. Um, but I would say that on the, on the conservative end, that is what a starting salary would look like for a lot of our students um, that are maybe hoping to stay, you know, right here in a local capacity. Um, there are other agencies around the country that have different incentives and larger, uh, larger packages as well. So, it, so it depends on the need, the demand. You know, if we have a lot of students, maybe that changes some. Um, it, that's a tough question to answer. I want to say the median income from the labor, which take that for what it is, is um, is it 67 for investigators? But again, I don't know where that information comes from. Um, next question. The students you showed were all women. The gender balance. So uh, one thing that's quite surprising is a lot of our students are female. Uh, the field itself is 65% uh, female, and we are predominantly female. Uh, we do have, you know, we do have some balance, but we actually are further than that in terms of our, our female to male ratio. So in terms of the sciences, it's, it's very heavy and dominated by uh, women from our Hamlin perspective. Um, are there students that take the intro survey class that figure out it's not for them? Uh, yes, there are students in all classes that um, take that class and realize maybe it's not for them. Um, 
and I can use the crime scene class as an example. It's not easy to get up from a phone call at two o'clock, one thirty in the morning, go out when it's five or 10 degrees and see a case through to completion and then get up the next day and go to work. And, and I had a student turn to me and say, I can't do this for 30 years. And, and I think that's just as powerful as the students that find their passion, because I'd rather them do that while they're here than go out into the field and, and be somewhat lost. So we try and get students into those scenarios with, with surveys specifically and say, you know what, these are the things that I like doing. This is why I'm drawn to forensic science and maybe how they can craft their, their path forward with other classes that's going to shape the remainder of their career. So yeah, that happens um, all the time. It's It just comes down to the student and, and maybe it's a little different than what they expected from what they've seen on TV. Um, great question. If I was speaking with a student interested in this area, what would be the key things that you would like them to know? Um, I think the the few things that I, I always mention for, for students, the number one skill is gonna be critical thinking. Um, and, and it's going to be passion, right? And if those two don't meet in a, in a person in the field, I don't believe they're going to be successful. And I don't think they're going to do a great service for, for those of us that depend on them. Um, you need that passion to solve cases. You need that critical thinking to avoid tunnel vision and prevent that case from being cold and being objective, fair in your assessment of evidence, be it on a crime scene to collect it or um, in a forensic lab as you test it. So I think those, and, and you do have to like science. That's another, you know, sort of prerequisite for this. Um, you can't do DNA without biology. You can't do DNA without chemistry. You can't understand these things at the level that we need to, to convey it to a jury of, of civilian citizens in our, our, uh, our communities at an expert level if you don't understand that. So those are the few things I think that are, are really important in future in the next generation of forensic scientists. Uh, good question. Have you worked with or like to collaborate with uh, the law school? Uh, yes, I mean, that is a, ultimately a forensic case goes there. We haven't uh, to date um, collaborated with the law school. We've, we've worked with our legal studies a program here, but as the program grows, I think there's great opportunity for that. If if the anonymous attendee is is interested or could facilitate that in some way, I'd be more than happy to have those conversations. Um, it um, that's that's where everything ends up. So you know we have we have mock testimony, and I think you know involving actual legal students is the next next step that'd be natural for us to take. Great, great point. Uh, for the forensic science degree is the course list mainly those are their general criminal justice as well. So a lot of our students, um, actually all students in Hamlin have to complete the, you know, breadth of study of the liberal arts um, as, as alumni know quite well. And that's where they'll take classes like crime and justice in America, where they understand their role within the criminal justice system. Um, we have students sometimes take those for electives if they're relevant to the area they're going in. Um, we have a lot of double majors, right? Because you think about Minnesota, in order to be a peace officer, you have to go through post-certification, which Hamlin also offers. So I have some students that are criminology, criminal justice, forensic and investigative science, and post. Um, so it, it across the spectrum, students get very, very interdisciplinary uh, from criminal justice to law to science and how all of that intermixes within this one role. So yes, yes, we do do that. Um, see, one more question. Responses to meth lab or fentanyl handling scene can be dangerous. You tap into available health and safety to educate them. So we have, we have health and safety policies we use complete biological specimens. So anything that they handle here that could have the potential to be um, biohazardous, we use authentic um, drug samples in that this is in fact the sample that you're, you're going to deal with. Now, 
in terms of those you saw in the crime scene, uh, students are in PPE. So they're gonna have um, on certain scenes where there's these types of substances, they're gonna have masks or more, but always they're in Tyvek suits, they're wearing gloves, shoe covers, all of that, because really that is a big challenge, not only for the, the public, but for the people that encounter it. Um, and there are certain realities that we can't convey to students. I can't have them stuck with needles. I can't do those things. But when we teach these things and we do practicals at the crime scene house, making sure that they're doing it in a way that's not going to be dangerous to themselves, others, um, et cetera. So, we, we share those, um, I can't even tell you how many times I, I mentioned that, showing what a lethal dosage of, of something like uh, heroin, fentanyl, carfentanyl, which is even worse. So it's, it's a big challenge in, in professional practice. So we, we try, but, and hopefully, hopefully it's, it's enough. That's all I can, that's all I can share. So with that, any other questions that you all have? Hopefully I answered those completely. Any follow-ups or anything? I'm not nice. hearing it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jamie. Thank you everybody for being here today too. And uh, Jamie's given permission to share his slides. So I'll send an email to those who were watching this presentation live um, and include those as well. So, um, Dr. Spalding, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and hope folks can join us again. It's been a pleasure and thank you everyone for attending. Appreciate it. Thank you.